Hello and welcome. I'm Laura Shepard, Director of Events at the Mechanics Institute. Thank you for joining us for our online program and the opening event for our Fête de Colette, January 25th through 27th, 2023. This is a three-day celebration of the 150th birthday of France's most famous and provocative woman writer, Sidonie Gabrielle Colette, 1873 to 1954, and also the reprinting of her beloved novel, Cherie and the End of Cherie, published by New York Review Books. Today's program, The Intimate Worlds of Colette, we are very pleased to welcome the translator of Cherie and End of Cherie, Paul April, in conversation with foremost Colette biographer, Judith Thurman. And our program is moderated by Zach Rogal. In addition to our panel today, our Fête de Colette will feature a performance of Colette Uncensored with renowned Bay Area actress, Lori Holt. And also our cinema lit film series will show Cherie starring Michelle Pfeiffer. We are proud to co-sponsor this event with the New York Review Books, City Lights Booksellers and Publishers, and the Fromm Institute for Lifelong Learning. If you're new to the Mechanics Institute, we were founded in 1854, and we are one of San Francisco's most literary and cultural centers in the heart of the city. We feature our general interest library, an international chess club, ongoing author and literary programs, and on Friday night, Cinema Lit Film Series. So please visit our website at milibrary.org. This talk today will be followed by a Q&A with you, our audiences, and we invite you to put your questions in the chat. Colette's Cherie, 1920, and its sequel, The End of Cherie, 1926, are widely considered her masterpieces. Paul April's new translation of these two celebrated novels bring out a vivid sensuality and acute intelligence that is so unique and so beautiful. In sensuous, elegant prose, the two novels explore the evolving inner lives and intimate relationship of an unlikely couple, Leia de Lonval, a middle-aged former courtesan, and Fred Pellu, 25 years her junior, known as Cherie. The story tells how they have come to a crossroads that will shift and change their relationship only by relinquishing the past. And now I'd like to introduce our guests. Paul April is a publisher, poet, and translator. Uh, for the New York Review Books Classics, he translated three novels by Jean Giorno, including Hill, The Open Road, and Melville, which was a co-winner of the 2018 Annual Translation Prize of the French American Foundation and he lives on Niagara Escarpment in Ontario, Canada. Our second guest, Judith Thurman, is the author of two prize-winning biographies, Secrets of the Flesh, A Life of Colette, and of Isaac Denison, The Life of a Storyteller, which won the National Book Award for Biography in 1983. Her other work includes essay collections, Cleopatra's Nose, 30, 39 Variations on, of Desire, and A Left-Handed Woman. And she is a staff writer at The New Yorker, specializing in cultural criticism. She is widely published as a literary critic, journalist, and a translator of poetry. And our moderator today, Zach Rogau, is an author, editor, or translator of more than 20 books or plays. His translations of French literature include two books by Colette, Shipwrecked on a Traffic Island and other previously untranslated gems, co-translated with René Morel, and the novel 
Green Wheat, which was shortlisted for the Penn Book of the Month Translation Prize, Rogau authored, co-authored the play Colette Uncensored, which will have his stage, which had its first staged mm -hmm. reading at Kennedy Center in Washington, DC, and has also been seen in London, Catalonia, Portland, and in many venues throughout San Francisco and the Bay Area. He has received the Penn Book of the Month Club Translation Prize for his translation of Earthlight by Andre Breton and the Northern California Book Reviewers Award in translation for this English version of Georges Sand's novel, Horace. So please welcome our esteemed guests. And I turn it over to our moderator, Zach Rogal. Laura, thank you so much. And I'm so delighted that Mechanic Institute has uh, organized this wonderful celebration of Colette's 150th birthday. And I'm honored to be part of that with Judith Thurman and Paul April. 150 years after her birth, in some ways Colette's work seems to me even more relevant today than in the past. I'm wondering, Judith and Paul, what aspects of her work and life have resonated most deeply for you? Well, I guess um, I'll just I'll just go first. I uh, I've spent my career really writing about the title of my essay is a left-handed woman, which applies to right-handed women as well, but women who uh, considered them were considered not right, sinister in some way, awkward in some way, threatening in some way. And in, in Colette's life, the aspects of her life, uh, in her work and in her life, more in her life really than in her work, uh, the, um, the struggle to become who she was, the struggle to uh, the you know the struggle against all kinds of voices of all, the old men of her society, uh, and this, particularly the struggle for um, to express a sexual identity that was transgressive uh, at <clears throat> at many at, actually in her case almost at, in most stages. So those have been some of the important uh, aspects of her of her life for me. But as a writer, I I read for. I read for sentences, I read for style, I read for the beauty of the language and Colette's, uh, the, the intoxicating beauty of Colette's language, but also the precision of it. It's just something that uh, has never ceased to move me. Well, I completely con concur. Um, her writing was so gorgeous and so original. You know, it, it still affects us today very deeply. Um, of course, it needs to be retranslated to continue to have the force that it deserves. But I mean, her style was um, incomparable in so many genres. Um, and that's a rarity, um, even today. Um, and her sensuality is astounding. But the way she combined it with penetrating insights into motives and desires and relationships um, it's still very challenging emotionally. Um, I mean, and so that means that it still feels very current. Um, it doesn't feel out, outmoded. Um, but again, I have to say that I think it, it um, bears out that um, the retranslation of great literature is always necessary. I, I just want to add one thing about what she means to me, which is that Colette was a total workhorse. And she, uh, and she's one of the rare writers whose who's force in some ways waxes rather than wanes as she gets older. She, she, she pretty much died with a pen in her hand. And that was such an inspiring model for me. Um, and uh, um, that you just, you keep going. You, she, she calls writing the vomitious, the vomitous task. And so, and, and it just gave me such a great sense of solidarity at the vomitous moments, which are many. Um, in in my own work, so I'm really grateful for that. And I mean, she was so so awake and receptive to the very very end. You know, this famous last word, regard. You know, like she she never stopped taking it in. I think That's inspiring. One other, one other aspect of her work that I find very prophetic is her love of nature and her appreciation of 
the whole environment that she grew up in. She grew up in a small town, and although she became a Parisian, she was always so aware of, of nature, its vitality, and its connection to human experience and imagery. Absolutely. And yeah, I was so impressed by, you know, the very opening of her first published work, though it was under Lily's name. But that first section of um, uh, Claudine Alecol, I mean, you feel like it's a, it's a kind of an ecological adventure um, in a forest. And it's so tactile and, and I mean, so synesthetic. She also has an enormous vocabulary about nature, an enormous vocabulary of um, uh, of botany, uh, you, you. I mean, I don't, I don't know one flower from another, but I know their names in French from, from reading her, mm. and, uh, and so, these were her familiar spirits, and and uh, the, the 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 flowers and the trees and the plants and the the winds and the and the the the, the swamp animals and, uh, mm. the um the the what is it called now the biosphere, of mm -hmm. uh, of Lower Burgundy. That was the aspect of her work that first attracted me. Um, and, you know, so to move into the ethos of the Sherry novels was, you know, quite a shift. And yet within the Sherry novels, there are some absolutely magical passages of descriptions of flora um, and, you know, settings. Um, she had a tremendous gift for that. I, and that's I think you also, you also have a gift for translating those passages. Probably. Oh, thank you. And, and I wanted to ask you, of, of all of Colette's books, and she wrote, I think, something like 50 books, what made you choose Cherie and The End of Cherie as the ones that you most wanted to translate? Well, as um, was already said, I mean, they're, they're renowned as masterpieces. Um, and they had been translated more than once in the past. Um, Cherie and published three times I believe, and, and um, the end of Sherry, or the last of Sherry, as it was being titled twice. Um, but um, those translations um, were arguably outmoded. That might be a euphemism. I'll come back to that. Um, but, but as it happened, um, under the copyright regime, the, both of the Sherry novels were about to come into the public domain um, there's a 95 year um, time delay uh, from their first publication. So there was an opportunity to um, return to them and, um, and endeavor to, well, both make them more contemporary, but also I think to alleviate some of the deficiencies in, in the existing and former translations. And I could point particularly to the ones that were done by a British uh, translator named Roger Sandhouse in the, well, the Sherry's were done in the 1950s. And I did look at them, I mean, before I even decided to take on Sherry, and I knew right away that something needed to be done because the, 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 the tone that he imparted to them was so inappropriate and he took so many um, outrageous liberties, um, you know, if you compare his versions to the originals. So recognizing that, knowing that the rights were going to become available, uh, I, I approached Edwin Frank, the editorial director at New York Review Books, um, who immediately expressed enthusiasm. He was a huge fan of the books, knew that the existing translation, especially this trade translation, um, was problematic. And so I found myself really entering the world of Colette. And um, could, could I interrupt yeah. you a second? Sure, of course. Can I can, uh, ask you to read a short passage from your translation. Oh, so absolutely. You can hear some of the music of the language. Absolutely. Um, I, I guess I should give a little bit of context. Um, Sherry, this uh, young, uh, young man, um, at, at, at this stage, you know, he's only 19. Um, uh, is at his mother's house in the conservatory. His mother is a former courtesan who is now quite wealthy. Um, and her close friend, Leia, is visiting. And um, Leia and Sherry already had quite an, uh, a close kind of 
friendship, the, a certain level of intimacy, but not expressed in erotic terms. Um, and so here we have Leia. Um, she flopped down in a chair and fanned herself. A sphinx moth and some big mosquitoes with long trailing legs were circling around the lamps and the smell of the garden since night had fallen had become a country smell. A whiff of acacia came inside, so distinct, so potent, that both of them turned around as though they expected to see it walking across the room. It's the acacia with the pink clusters, said Leah in an undertone. Yes, said Shiri, but tonight it's had so much orange blossom to drink. She looked him over vaguely, admiring that he'd thought of this. He was inhaling the scent like a willing victim, and she turned away, all of a sudden, fearing he wouldn't beckon her. But he did beckon her, all the same. And she came. She came to him to kiss him with a bitter and selfish impulse and thoughts of chastisement. Wait, hold on, it's absolutely true. You have a beautiful mouth. This time, I'm going to drink my fill because I want to, and I'll let you have your way. It's a shame, but I don't care. I'm coming. She kissed him so hard that they pulled back, drunk, deafened, breathless, trembling, as though they just fought physically. She took her place again on her feet in front of him. He hadn't budged. He nestled still in the depths of the rocker, and she taunted him softly. And so, so, and braced herself for an insult. But he held his arms out, opened his lovely trembling hands, laid back his wounded head, and revealed between his lashes the matching sparkle of two tears. Meanwhile, he murmured words, groans, a feral and amorous ode. She could make out her name and repeated, darlings and comes and never leaves you. An ode that she listened to while bending over him, full of apprehension, as if she'd unwittingly done him great harm. I think that passage illustrates very well what you were saying about her, her psychological insights. There's such complexity in that one scene and the feelings of the characters are so well fleshed out there. They are so fleshed out. I, it's, as I return to it and read my own translation, I'm amazed to discover how much dissonance she was able to encapsulate. Ambiguity, ambivalence, dissonance, and that makes the character so real, I think. So what, what are some of the challenges in translating Colette that are unique to her work? Well, I mean, they're, they're, her prose, I don't actually agree with the characterization of her prose as having been lean. I'm not exactly sure what that's supposed to say, because I think it's very, very rich and very organic. And she had such an immense vocabulary. I mean, especially for someone who was essentially you know, like a basically a secondary education, but she read so voraciously and um, clearly was like a sponge when it came to picking up um, wonderful, rare kinds of words, but also the way she found the nuances in more common words. And as a translator, well, three of us, we know, um, you know, you're faced with how do you construe the, the words? And then there could be a sort of first level of equivalence, the more obvious ones, and you start trying to put them in place. But with Colette, what I found is that if you just stay at that level, it, it just, it doesn't flow. It, it isn't convincing and it doesn't sound natural. And what I strive for, I, I think most translators do, is a certain level of naturalness in the diction especially in dialogue. And so um, with Colette, I, I would have to spend a great deal of time and, and, and put a lot of thought into finding just the right 
equivalence without straying too far. Um, you know, there are no strict rules to this. And as a reader of translations, you're very much a passive recipient of choices, you, have, you know, unless you do compare to the original, which almost no one would do. Um, so, you know, it's, not, it's on your own conscience. You know, what are, what are your ethics as a translator? How far are you gonna go away from what could be considered the denotation of those words or the more strict of those words? So I hope that I have managed to pull that off um, and, 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 and achieve some kind of naturalness in the diction. Um, I think another, another challenge that I've found translating her is that um, she has so many gifts as a writer, so many modes that she can draw from. Mm -hmm. there, there's that sensual description that you've talked about that Judith also mentioned. There's, there's her psychology as a, as, a, as a creator of characters. There's also her humor. Her, some of her dialogue in Cherie is, is just so witty. It's just amazing. So you have to be at the top of your game as a translator all the time in trying to find something that, that can approach what she creates in her French. It's, Judith, it's I wonder if you would read a favorite passage of yours from Sherry, yeah. maybe, would you also read the French, is that? Yes, I, I, I chose this passage in the introduction to the volume to just because I was talking about Colette rather than about Paul for most, mm. of the, most of the essay, but I wanted readers to be able, those who, or, who can read French and even those who can't read French, just to uh, be able to experience the quality of her language and the quality of his version of it. Because one thing about this translation is, one thing about translation in general, you know you're reading a foreign language, but this the foreignness has somehow been um, modified, not completely eliminated, but modified in such a way that you are not aware of it anymore. You know, it's like listening to uh, the speaker of a foreign language whose grammar and syntax and vocabulary is so uh, masterful that the accent ceases to, or the accent is there, but it ceases to be any obstacle whatsoever. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is this is a, a passage um, towards the end of the end of, of Cherie when Cherie has just left Leah's, Leah's apartment, uh, which is one of the greatest scenes in literature. He's, uh, um, he discovers, I don't know, spoiler alert, he discovers her, this woman whom he has adored, he hasn't seen her in years, and she has not only aged, she's surrendered to age. She's surrendered to the pleasures of her flesh. She's surrendered to a kind of uncorseted, um, not vigilant mode of living. And he's devastated. Um, so he he goes, he leaves like a sleepwalker to find himself in, in a street which he doesn't recognize. He's, he's in a trance and, and he says, Colette writes, Il remarqua que le ciel rose et se mirait dans le ruisseau gorgé encore de pluie sur le dos bleu des hirondelles volant à ras de terre et parce que l'heure devenait fraîche et que traîtreusement le souvenir qu'il importait se retirait au fond de lui-même pour y prendre sa force et sa dimension définitive. Il crut qu'il avait tout, tout oublié et il sentit heureux. Mm. And this is, is Paul's English. He did notice that the pink sky was being reflected by the stream in the gutter, which was still swollen with rain, and off the blue backs of the swallows that were swooping level with the ground. And because the evening air was cooling down and the memory he had taken away with him was shrinking like a traitor into the inmost depths of his being, there to assume its definitive power and scale, he believed he'd forgotten all about it and he felt happy. Thank you for <laughs> highlighting that, that wonderful passage. So we, we've touched briefly on um, how Sherry and Colette's work in general uh, deals with questions of gender and gender fluidity. And I'm wondering how does that 
aspect of the novel uh, relate to the current discussions that are happening about the whole issue of gender and gender fluidity? Well, I think it's so affirmative, um, especially in terms of the transition that Leah makes um, from a, a much more decidedly feminine character, a, a former harlot, if you will, um, who's very concerned with, um, still with her um, female character, like the more stereotypical uh, female attractiveness. And then, you know, enters what, I mean, Judith was so well describing. Um, I think Colette describes it uh, when, when um, Sherry encounters her again after a lapse of many years that she had, had um, uh, assumed a kind of easygoing virility. Um, and there's, there's something, you know, a, a completely um, uh, liberated, I would say, about how she presents Leia is presented at that stage. And this, of course, is devastating for, um, for Sherry because he, he hadn't understood, it hadn't occurred to him that this uh, woman he had adored um, might go through such a profound change. And not just in, in her um, gender uh, characteristics, but also she'd become very heavy. Um, and she was entirely comfortable with that as well. And she'd stopped dressing in any kind of um, ornate okay. way, fashionable way. She wore the simplest kinds of clothes and she was completely comfortable in them. So I think this is all, you know, very aff affirmative and inspiring for all of us, you know, in terms of not having to conform, but being able to be comfortable in our own skin. And um, yeah, and uh, so that, that was in a sense quite ahead of its time. Well, the whole world of the demi monde and the world of the courtesans, who, which is the world of the of the two chenies, uh, they are now. This represents a minuscule percentage of women who sold their bodies, who were forced to to, to work in the sex trade. It was the it was the the top echelon, but they were women who had achieved something that almost no other women in that society could achieve, which was autonomy. Uh, they didn't have husbands. Uh, they because in under under the laws of France, your husband um, was was still the guardian of your property, and uh, they were they 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 were they were um, they were free of husbands. They were free of the control of men. They arranged their lives for their own pleasure, and their pleasure very often included um, keeping much younger lovers, both male and female, um, who they who became who played the role in their lives that they had played in the lives of the various men who had kept them. So uh, it's a, it's a, a, there were some great actresses who, uh, who also managed to achieve that kind of freedom. But um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a window, if you like, um, into a kind of gynocracy, mm -hmm. um, which, it, which these books are. And they are, and the, and the end of Sherry is one, especially because uh, Sherry's just as he's just as he's dismayed and horrified by what Leah has become, he's dismayed and horrified by what his beautiful, submissive young wife has become. She is the unseemly competence of this uh, completely sort of ambitious and driven woman who was once a um, a submissive uh, teenage girl when they married, and his old mother, who's who's uh, seems to be a day trader on the stock market. She's amassed this portfolio, and they have endowed a hospital. So uh, it's examples of not entirely benevolent examples of female industry and entrepreneurship and autonomy because Colette in many respects, one shouldn't forget this. this she's not trying to set um, you know, a politically correct model of, of, uh, of a new world. She sort of takes Sherry's side on this. She, she sort mm. of, she, she in many ways sympathizes with the men whom she has always considered the weaker sex. And in some ways pathetic, but I'd also like to say because it's it's I, that Colette's lover, uh, the Marquise de Morny, who who in some ways rescued her from her marriage to Willie, and she would now I believe they would now be, I believe consider themselves transgender, not transvestite, and um, and I think that 
this very publicly lived relationship between um, a woman who was then gay, Colette, and a, and a person who was trans, who thought of themselves as trans, transgender, uh, it, it was way, be, way, 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 way ahead of its time. There were, there was a, there was a, a lesbian demimonde in Paris, very famous and, and creative one, but uh, there were not many people as radical in their, in their gender identity as, as Missy was. And she it was, was and she was she was known to her nieces to she, they were known to their nieces and nephews uh, as Uncle Max, and and an extremely touching moment when um, when their uh, brother died, the head of the family, they dressed as a woman for the funeral, and the nieces and nephews were so appalled that they asked them to go home and and come as themselves. It was a famous moment where um, Colette, who who at one point earned her living as a mime. Um, had Missy act with her. I think it was, was it at the... Um, was Rêve d'Egypte, Dream of Egypt. That was the play, yeah. Yes, so um, Colette is playing uh, an Egyptian mummy who's, who's an Egyptian princess, and she comes out of her wrappings of, as a mummy and kisses uh, an archeologist who's played by Missy by a woman on stage. And, and this was caused such an enormous scandal that you know the police had to be called in to subdue the riot. Hmm. And this was when, like around 1910, maybe that this happened. Yeah, a little bit and, later. And Colette famously bared her breast on stage, which was also very bold and and quite liberated in a sense. There's there's something else in terms of her her um, um, assertiveness, aggression, even on this subject, which was that uh, at one point she and Missy were hanging out with <clears throat> socializing with her, her husband Willie and his mistress Meg and there was all kinds of gossip in the papers about this and she said I don't know what you were finding so worth gossiping about we're simply two cu couples who have arranged to live according to our pleasure mm -hmm. so uh this was just an in-your-face reply to mm -hmm. the hypocrisy of the Belle Epoque because um, if you read Proust, if you read Colette, if you read almost any writer of the Belle Epoque, it was one of the most highly sexualized, eroticized um, moments in history. Well, which that's hard to say because they all seem to be, but but it was especially it was especially. Yeah. <laughs> but it still took enormous courage, I think, to, oh, to live to live that, live those values and ideals. In fact, I, I, it's it's almost hard to comprehend how someone could be that. Um, you know, that, that bold um, in a society. Um, and what, you know, they it was such a, what you were saying about the, um, the aging cocottes who, you know, had, had amassed a lot of money. I mean, you know, they had gained power, like real power, um, which was extraordinary. And they were inverting the whole, the, the conventional relationship between the sexes. Um, and this it, is over 100 years ago, yeah. It's also worth pointing out what a tremendous liberation there is from um, having to, from society, because they were not welcome in, in, in high society. They were not welcome in the salons of Paris. They were fallen women. And so, and so were, so were uh, Georges Saint and George mm. Eliot, the two Georges. Uh, yeah. They and so they didn't have to bother with those tiresome calls and the teas and the dinners and sitting at the table and the little gloves, and they could work. So, um, so being a fallen woman was uh, a get out of jail free card in some respects for women who had better things to do. Mm. So, well, another thing that uh, it was very unusual about this book, uh, Cherie, and and a theme that runs in several of Colette's books is the romance of the older woman and the younger man. And in French literature, this is a longstanding theme that goes back to, at least to Benjamin, Benjamin Constant's novel Adolphe, which was published in 1816. Actually, it goes back to Phèdre. Oh, Phèdre, mm. yes. Um, mm. And so um, Annie Ernaud, who recently won the Nobel Prize, also wrote her book, Getting Lost, on, on a theme like this. It's, it's mm -hmm. something that French writers are very comfortable dealing with. And yet there's so few ex examples of this in English language literature. I'm wondering why, why that is, why 
does this theme of the older woman and the younger man somehow challenge uh, the Anglo-Saxon world more than it does in France? Well, it is fascinating, isn't it? Um, I mean, there are um, Balzac, Stendhal. I mean, they they had um, characters who were you know young men, twenty years younger than than the women they were with. Um, and uh, you know, I was so curious about this. Um, I went online and looked to see, um, you know, how often had this older woman, younger man relationship occurred in English literature? Well, I got three hundred and fifty results, but they're not serious books. They're all um, sensational kind of titillating books. And I, 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 I at the risk of offending anyone, I, I think it has to do with the way that, that masculinity is understood and defined in France as opposed to America or you know, the English speaking world. I, I think that this is a very important element in the Cherie books as well, where the, the where Cherie is he is infantilized and feminized, you know, repeatedly. Um, and so th there isn't a contradiction in Leia having a great deal of power and control over him. Um, and so I, I think that it, it in English, um, in English societies, um, there's, there's much less of um, a willingness to portray a male protagonist with those qualities. Now, I'm sure I'm general, overgeneralizing, but I think you have to look for clues somewhere because it is striking. Mm. It's is also, making, it's, no, uh, it does. I, I also, at the risk of offending people, um, <laughs> there's, uh, uh, there's this, of course, um, a, a strand of Puritanism. If we're talking about England for the moment, a strand mm. of Puritanism um, uh, in, in English culture, there's in the world of English literature up until modern times, which was, a, 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 for the most part, upper middle class uh, world. Um, there was uh, uh, the the um, demands of, of masculinity were about domination, and as you said, the notion of an old of a woman being the dominating partner it was was probably horrific in in, in some deep psychological way. Mm -hmm. uh, and and there's you know the the idea also of fearlessness. The, there's, there's a fearlessness to eroticism in my own experience in, in, in France, uh, a curiosity that is often not true in, uh, um, in America and in England. If you, you, know, you go to a party, there's, it, it's channeled. The, the channels are narrower. The, the channels of, of desire seem to be narrow. Now that is a gross, gross kind of ridiculous generalization but there's truth in there's truth in it too oh, there is sure I, I think there's also the question of repression of women if you're going to repress someone you have to repress them sexually as well because that's a facet of human mm -hmm. experience and it's it's part of the patriarchy that women's sexuality has been um has has been constrain that's absolutely true and the but in france women have been certainly constrained i mean they only got the vote like in 1946 7 um but uh but their desire has been respected that's very french um other mm -hmm. aspects no it's a, a patriarchal culture like any other uh, western culture but um but in terms of female desire that has been nurtured in in many ways and respected and 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 has been a source of fascination. So there are there are. Uh, it's hard to talk about this stuff without being sort of ridiculously general. But mm -hmm. well, so an, another thing that really struck me about the world of Cherie is how much people are measured by how young and attractive they are by their taste in clothing, jewelry, furniture, food and drink. It kept reminding me in many ways of our contemporary culture and and how focused we are on you know being foodies on how we look on not not showing age um i mean did do you feel there's something resonant about this side of the of the novel and also how what is colette's ultimate verdict on on that very 
um, uh, very judgmental view of people through through their their tastes and their their looks. Well, I, I think that Colette sets it up so artfully because in the first book, there is this great deal of attention to appearance, to the superficial material aspects of life. Um, but then it, it, it gets completely subverted in, in the end of Shiri by, you know, Leia's new persona. Um, and in, that, in, in so many ways, it feels more valid, more at ease. I mean, it's emphasized, you know, that she, she's, she's so comfortable in this new uh, way of, of being, of living. She's discarded all of that dross. Um, and um, yeah, so I think that uh, I assume, and Judith, you would, you know, know uh, better than I, or you too, Zach, because you both explored her life in so much more depth than I have, but that this would, we, this would correspond quite well with, with Colette's own evolution um, uh, in, in, in her own way of life and her, her, her own habits. Am I right? Yes, you know, you're definitely right. I was going to say one thing, one thing that your, especially the first, your first reading brings back and that, and that Zach, you heightened when you're in your comments on it. Her great strength is her, the ability to express and contain paradox. And that is true of her own character. So on the one hand, Colette gets fat and she doesn't worry about it. She loves food. She's never going to deprive herself of a single calorie for any reason. Uh, she doesn't disapprove of people who smoke too much, but a cigarette now and then is a delightful pleasure. Why on earth give it up? Um, she has a series of younger lovers uh, uh, in her own life, including her stepson, uh, who is not who is not Cherie, but but um, uh, originally, but certainly that that relationship echoes in the in the end of Cherie. So she and then she marries a man 17 years, her, her last husband, 17 years, her junior, um, knowing full well that at some point she'll be a very old woman and he will go out and have love affairs uh, on his own and that that is completely natural. So and yet and yet and yet she uh, can be extremely disapproving of um, almost as if she had internalized the patriarchy. She can be ex ext extremely disapproving. Of uh, of women who let themselves go, and of her daughter who was a lesbian, and, you know, she she said, "Oh, it's fine to uh, experiment with, but you don't want to do it full time." And so there are there are, one shouldn't overlook the incongruities and the contradictions because uh, having lived them, they're visceral to her, and so she they are in her work, and that's part of its power. They are so women famously. Present. I'm sorry, sorry. one woman famously said, uh, do I contradict myself very well? I contradict myself. I contain multitudes. Exactly. Yeah. Well, as I said, going back over the text, I, I really was struck by how much dissonance and, and paradox um, there, there was, you know, on almost every page. Um, and yet somehow it all adds up to a very believable character. And maybe that's because we are all complex and um, full of contradictions. I think there's a great deal of truth in that. So the character of Sherry, when I reread the book in your translation, Paul, um, I noticed that that many times he's described, quote, as a brat. And um, is that really the whole of Sherry's personality? If he's more than that, what more? is there to Sherry and what is the significance of Sherry as a character today? Well, I, I think that the answer to that um, has to um, take the measure of the degree to which Sherry is a, is a tragic character. Um, you know, at first he is um, just, just a scoundrel and a rascal and he, he misbehaves and acts out and he's spoiled, um, you know, um, and somewhat feckless, um, but um, gradually, I think one realizes that um, he, is a vic he is a victim. It's not to say that he shouldn't have taken more steps to assert himself or define himself. But first of all, think of the environment he grew up in. I mean, he's, he's growing up in a brothel. He has no father. Um, he effectively has no mother other than a sort of drill sergeant 
Martinet, um, <laughs> who, who is quite sadistic towards him a number of times. Um, and so the, the poor kid, you know, it's not a wonder that he, he, he doesn't really assume a strong, coherent identity and is in fact what Colette calls him repeatedly, un nourrissant méchant, nourrissant suggesting that he's still sort of nursing, he hasn't been weaned, um, and, um, and his, his personality, his character never fully formed. And then as a, like an enormous double whammy that has societal dimensions, he has to go through the war and, um, he, and he's alienated as a soldier, he gets a medal, but he doesn't even believe he deserved it. Comes back to a world that's changed where everyone else seems to have moved on. And so, you know, once again, he, he's cast out, where does he belong? And he, he laments this and, then, and that begins the long and um, agonizing downward trajectory that he goes through. And so I you, think, yeah, there's, oh, yeah. I, I, <laughs> In your, in your biography, you describe Sherry as acting out a kind of noble revolt against modernity. Can you say more about what? Yes, well, he, he, he's a, these are, in a way, Colette creates this kind of Eden, this, this little demimonde of Eden. Of, uh, it's, it's a world in which, a world of almost total hedonism. And she, she sees this as noble in a way. She sees, you know, all these people trading stocks and and opening restaurants and uh, 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 and and being bankers and 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 it, it, it's it, it's a strangely archaic patrician notion of the beauty and nobility of of hedonism mm -hmm. and um and and Shari in some ways when he comes back from the war he comes back to a world in which that is passé in which it is not only passé but it's somehow disreputable and he's uh, he's uh, dépaysé. He's sort of exiled into this the the world of the twenties of speed and of of of, uh, of industry. And um, uh, he, he's you know not every not every sort of self indulgent hedonist is an artist. But in some ways, Leah is, and so is Sherry. And so his this he he can't practice his art anymore. He's his life is futile. And you would think that this is this one of these counterintuitive things that a life of hedonism is the feudal life, but in some ways Colette's suggesting um, that uh, a, you know a life of purpose that's of capitalist purpose is much more sinister than a life of of, uh, of aesthetic appreciation of the body and the senses. What, what you're saying, uh, what you're both saying, reminds me a little bit that uh, Colette's mother, Cido. Um, came from a family where her siblings, her brothers, were very influenced by the utopian socialist movement of the Romantic era, which was very strong in France. They were the Saint-Simonians and the Fourierists, and this uh, vein of socialism was um, something that talked about the sanctification of the flesh. The, the Saint-Simonians talked about the sanctification of the flesh. So there was a kind of hedonistic strain to French socialism, oddly, in the very early days that I think kind of flows into maybe. That's, no, that's a very important thing to point out. Also, Fourier, one of his principles was that the sexuality of the children had to be respected. And mm. it was, it was in practice, we don't, I'm not sure how well that worked out, but, but, uh, but, but that was a radical, it's a radical notion. First of all, in a Christian culture, the children are sexual. Uh, and then that that their desires that they that they have erotic desires and that they should be respected. Mm -hmm. So you 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 began talking a little bit about this generation that lived through World War One and the tremendous upheaval that people who either fought in the war or were touched by it experienced, and then the post-war era of the end of Sherry. Um, can you say more about? this lost generation, the generation of Sherry that experienced the war and then had to adjust again to post-war life and how that was kind of a shock for, for many at that time. Well, going back to the feminist point, the men were away, millions died, women were running the country and they, they weren't so eager to give up the power uh, and the sense of significance and the sense of, of um, 
of exteriority of, of 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 being in the world, not as ornaments, but as 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 doers and and uh, shakers. So uh, many of the men left their little women at home and came back to find them transformed, as did Sheri. Uh, mm -hmm. So that that was one of the um, remarkable shifts that happens in French culture, and it's not stable. It goes, as I say, we didn't get the vote until the forties. So it, there's tremendous repression of that too, because it was pretty horrifying. It was women were running around in short skirts and cutting their hair and smoking and drinking and 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 uh, uh, and having sex before they were married. Once you were married in France, it was different. But young girls were doing this. So uh, that's I think that's part of what happened in that generation. And yet, Colette sympathizes in some way, as you were saying, with with Cherie's alienation from this post-war world. She she does <clears throat> she does she. She, um, there's this, I, I've written about this, there's the voice, even as liberated as she was, as transgressive as she was, there was a deep, she's a deeply conservative writer, I think, also, mm -hmm. that's one of the contradictions, she's deeply conservative about, about so many things, uh, and it's almost, um, it's almost trance, in a way, you know, that this, that this free woman, this, this bold, uh, this bold writer, this uh, bisexual woman, uh, often speaks with this this voice of the old patriarchs, the right wing, um, you know, the fathers and the husbands. So uh, she she finds women sort of um, d dismayingly. Uh, what's the word that she uses? She has her word is the is the best the best word in the novels. Yes. Well, she uses she uses it. No, she uses it in a letter. Mm. Uh, how how yeah. feminine delicacy in literature, she wrote to a friend, is one of those cliches that make me furious. Except for three or four female writers, women's vulgarity, their sentimental brutality has all that it takes to make any man whatsoever feel wounded and embarrassed. That's also the voice of Colette. Sure. And that's very much like her comment on feminism, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> with the whip in the harem like she says if any, if any french women have the, the thought of the nerve to think of embracing feminism they deserve the whip in the harem yeah <laughs> i think she delighted in that it's a perfect contradiction too yeah <laughs> so I, I see that we have some questions from our um audience and uh i would love to hear um what their thoughts are and and what judith and, and paul think of that uh in in response great um zach the first question is in the q a box and has a french quote so we're going to ask you to read uh that is there a q a box i don't see it um if you open up at the bottom of your screen the q a box um I think it, it's the quote that oh. I referred to earlier about, um, you know, love that's well nourished and love that's badly or poorly nourished. Um, Paul, if you want to take that. Okay. So should I read it out? Yes, read please read, read out the question. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I think it is in La Fin de Chérie where she writes in Leah's point of view, quote, si on voulait être sincère, on avouerait qu'il y a l'amour bien nourri et l'amour mal nourri. Et le reste, c'est de la littérature. Um, so it's a very visceral notion of, of love um, and uh, an unsentimental one, that's for sure. And I think this, it actually brings up a point that I wanted to make that, you know, one thing that I love about Colette in all her writing and all her thinking is that she never abstracts, or at least I don't think she ever abstracts things. Um, there's always some kind of concrete uh, connection. Um, and, um, and so in, in the way that she obviously talks about bodies and about desires and all that, it's never as it is so often, I think in, in English literature, um, you know, translated into some kind of you know, con conceptual, um, rarefied kind of feeling. Yeah, 
Should I have translated that whole quote? Um, if you if you want to be sincere or honest, I guess you you would admit that there is well fed or well nourished love and poorly nourished love, and the rest of it, it's literature. In other words, it's just em embroidered. It's just invented. It's not um, the real thing. But Judith, do you have? Further I, I can't see the I can't see the oh, question. Oh, um, I don't you know. don't have the Q&A button. Uh, what, what I think if you go to your chat. I mean, um, the chat's open. There's a Q&A um, mode in the chat. Do you um, see if the you, function if you... is at the bottom, along the bottom part of your screen, yeah. next to participants, if you see that. It That's could it. be oh, either sure. Q&A. OK. OK. That's good. Yeah. Oh, may I interrupt just to say I didn't read the rest of the previous question, um, which came from Sarah Diligenti at the uh, Alliance Francaise in Washington, I believe. Sorry, I do not have the translation with me. Would you agree with this definition of literature? After all, Colette's writing is full of, quote, nourriture terrestre. Um, I think that Colette was being, you know, quite arch. It's quite funny what she yeah. says about, about the two kinds of love. Um, so I can't say whether I agree with it or not. I mean, I think there's a lot of other kinds of literature, but she, it's an interesting, yeah. It's a, that, the way she phrases that is something that you, is, it comes, she, um, she liked to make fun of literature, but by which she didn't mean, uh, literature, by which she meant writers posing. Mm -hmm. uh, someone uh, in a radio interview, and she was an old woman living with arthritis, with terrible arthritis, bent bound, living at the Palais Royal, asked her a long, complicated question, and she just looked at him and, he, and, she, and she said, Mon enfant, ça pue la littérature. <laughs> which means, my boy, that stinks of literature. <laughs> so that, that notion of the sentimental, the invented, uh, the, the systematizing, this is you either have a good meal and you love it and you both have, you're satisfied at the end or some mean scraggly un unappetizing dish has been presented to you. Uh, and let's get serious about this. I think that uh, that was part of her character. Yeah, quite arch. There, Other questions? There's an additional um, question from Jennifer Saito. Paul mentioned some egregious liberties the British translation took with Sherry. What are they and why do you think he took them? Oh, well, I think he was being lazy and um, you know, sort of cheating. In fact, at its worst, well, maybe not its worst, but this is something that I think people find hard to believe. But when you examine an original text against a translation, you can find that a translator has simply left out whole sentences and you know whole phrases that were difficult to construe. And Sandhouse did that a number of times, um, you know, which uh, I found appalling. But again, as I said earlier, as a reader of the translation, you really wouldn't wouldn't know that. So, but the worst thing I think overall that Sandhouse did is he tried to um, uh, impose a kind of um, British bohemian tone to the entire book um, to sort of transpose from Paris in, in the Belle Epoque to London in I don't know when. Um, but it just to me came across as false, very false. And uh, in, in specific instances, um, he would just uh, uh, wantonly change um, parts of speech and you know, render things in completely uh, inappropriate ways. So it's a highly faulty translation. Um, but at the same time, it, 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 it was um, read by countless readers for decades. And, 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 you know, on that basis, a lot of people loved Colette. So, you know, I think, again, it just emphasizes that um, all great 
literature needs to be retranslated over time. And um, uh, even, you know, my new translation, and there's been another new tr translation of the two Sherry novels, um, which I think are both, well, they're improved, big improvements. Eventually, they will need to be superseded. It's hard to imagine at this moment how and why, but I think they will. I, I, I ran into this I, problem with uh, Roger Senhouse translation when I was retranslating Le Blé en Herbe which he translated as the ripening seed and I named green wheat. And there's a lot of teenage dialogue in that book. And Roger Senhouse, who was, was an eminent member of the Bloomsbury group and the lover of Lytton Strachey, you know, I do honor him, but he translated the dialogue into British boarding school slang of the 1920s, which is what he knew. And it just doesn't sound right today. It might have sounded right in 1920, in the 1920s. There's, there's one other thing I want to raise here, which is sexism, because there are two egregious examples of great French women writers being translated by men. One, Simone de Beauvoir, the first translation, that, which has been superseded by an excellent one by, uh, by, by two, two women, and, and Colette. I'm not saying that he wasn't trying to be, I think liberties were taken, things were cut uh, in, in a sort of, um, uh, a way that would not have happened with a male writer. I, I really mm. have to say that because I've seen that with Beauvoir, I've seen it with Colette, um, and uh, I haven't made a study of this to see if this is true uh, across the border down the line, but it's worth somebody out there should do it. It would be an interesting, I'd like to see what, what turned up. Um, I um, just want to say that if anybody is having trouble accessing chat, Please send your go ahead and send post your questions to the Q and A, because so that we can read them. Um, uh, I just want to make sure everybody is able to to post post in chat. So, while we're waiting, then it, uh, for the moment, um, another comment about uh, the previous translations of Shiri and La Fin de Shiri. The first translation of Shiri was done by Janet Flanner, who was an eminent uh, journalist and lived in Paris. I think Judith, would she have actually known Colette? She did. She did, yeah. So she had access to a lot of information. And um, she, was also, she was also a lesbian, which is important. Oh, part of yeah. That. yeah, yeah. And, and, and indeed her translation was very fine. Um, uh, I looked at it, and um, but it was it was part of its era, and th this is true of any translation. Um, so it it sounds today a little antiquated. Um, it has a charm, but it's it's not um, as coll well colloquial, I guess you could say, as as what I think I, I've striven to to impart to my version. Um, but again, I mean. What I what I consider to be natural and colloquial for today's ears, 40, 50 years from now, may may well sound quite dated. Well, will sound quite dated. Uh, Paul, I was going to ask, you know, now that you've finished this translation, are you considering another book of Colette's to translate? Or also, I'd like to ask both of you, but what are your next projects in translation? Huh. Um, well, um, it's interesting you should ask because, and, and, and going back to something that Judith said, um, I think La Naissance du Jour um, probably should be done. Um, I think it would be an extremely challenging project um, because of the, the, the nature of the writing. It's a, it's a genre unto itself. Um, and, but I mean, it, it's something that I have in mind, but in fact, I think my next project will be a departure in, in many respects, um, but not entirely because um, it will be a novel that involves um, a very enigmatic young man with ambiguous sexuality, um, which is a novel by Stendhal called Armance. Mm -hmm. 
that was written 100 years before the Sherry novels um, and, and was translated 100 years ago by um, Moncrief, who was the great translator of Proust. Mm -hmm. And it hasn't been done since then. So I've sort of, I'm, I'm considering that as my next project. Well, I've, I've gone down a rabbit hole where I've gotten very interested in the, the Romantic era, partly through Georges Sand and yes. Alfred de Musset and that whole circle of, of writers who I think were very prophetic in their uh, views on, on, on the world. And um, there was a writer named Henri Murger who wrote the, the book that uh, La Boheme, the opera, was based on. And right now I'm kind of combing through his work to see what I can find. Fascinating. I, I what, was, what are what are your what are your projects right now as well? And you have a new book coming out. I have a new book, the book of essays, and um, which was published in December. And um, I'm right now. I, I I'm still on staff at the New Yorker, and there are several stories that I want to pursue. But I've been just um, after 50 years of writing nonfiction and and journalism, and sort of one one commission after another. I've just been playing around with something for myself and we'll see what happens to it. There is one additional, there is one additional question from John Wright. Are there any major works of Colette not translated into English? I, I would say no. I mean, my, my project, you know, um, Shipwrecked on a Traffic Island and other previously un untranslated gems was an attempt to kind of uh, find the things that had fallen through the cracks and there there wasn't a lot of work that I could uh, there were 600 pages that I was considering for that mm. for that uh, volume and I chose about 200 of the, what I thought was the best she, it, um, yes wait is um Mes Apprentissages translated yes it is mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah I think that the the real issue is which ones need most and soonest to be retranslated. Yeah. She did write a lot of journalism. Judith, you were talking about her journalism. Can you say more about that? Well, she, she was the uh, editor, she was an editor and a uh, uh, correspondent for um, the, the largest Paris daily for a very long time. And then it's theater critic for a while. And she was writing three pieces a week. Uh, often re reviews of plays. She had an advice column, as you, which you translated. She she reported on true crime. She loved true crime. Uh, and she thought it was much more interesting than the rest of the news, as most people do. If you you know sort of uh, um, look at the look at all of the the crime coverage uh, in in mainstream media. Uh, so she um, she was in that sense a cultural reporter. Uh, a, 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 um, and uh, she, that was her main source of, that was livelihood. You know, she did earn money from her fiction, but it was, uh, it was Le Matin that kept her afloat. And she, and she, she reported a great deal on, on the war, didn't she? She was a war correspondent, absolutely. She was yeah. right there at the front lines at one point, which she was very good for a woman at that time. She snuck in, she, her husband was there. Uh, Henri de Jouvenet was there and she managed to smuggle herself to the front lines and to live in secrecy because she wasn't supposed to be there. And she wrote, she wrote about that. She wrote about the, um, she wrote, she reported from Rome um, before Italy entered the war. Uh, she, um, yeah, she, her political reporting is not her great stuff. It's not her greatest work, I have to say, but as you would- Has expect, all her journalism been collected and published in French? Yes. There, there was a recent book that was edited by Frédéric Maget of her journalism, I believe, in French. But it's also in the Pléiade. Is it? Uh-huh. Yeah. Mm. There's you know, one our, our last question is, uh, what is the best biography of Colette? And we must say that Judith Thurman's Biography. <laughs> not translated. Not translated. Not tra oh, trans <laughs> the translated? Yeah. No, it, it's it is. It's the, translated. Uh, the English translation of, of um Secrets of the Flesh. Yeah. No, it was written in French. English, it's, but it's translated into French. It's in it's written in English, of course, but it's it, yes. it does have a French yes. trans, trans, French translation. It, it's, it's, a, it's a surpassingly great translation, great biography. 
There's no doubt about it. Great. And I also want to mention if anyone is interested in purchasing either Sherry, End of Sherry, and the Purity and Pure, uh, we have them on site here at the Mechanics Institute for sale, and they will be on sale tomorrow during our performance of Colette Uncensored and also at our Cinema Lit Film Series on Friday. But I think we're going to bring our program to a close. This, this has been just so inspiring to have, to have you all together. I want to thank Judith Thurman and Paul April and Zach Rogal for an amazing, amazing conversation for our Fête de Colette and the worlds, exploring the worlds of Colette. Um, in all of Colette's writings, she embraces all of our intimacies of emotion, love, desire, pleasure, and pain. She is truly a liberated woman and we celebrate her uh, for how she embraces life, this, this huge embrace of life and love. I just want to particularly thank yes. Zach, probably also on behalf of Paul for his mm. wonderful questions and his searching, um, you know, really getting, getting to the important, the pith of the subject. Well, and it's such a pleasure to talk us. with you, Judith, and you, Paul. And thank you again, Laura, for inviting all of us. Thank you, Laura. This great. This has been great. such a great pleasure. And we, we hope to have you all back together for another program. Merci beaucoup. Uh, merci tout le monde. And we will see you uh, tomorrow night at our Colette Uncensored with Lori Holt. Have a great day today and uh, au revoir.